Hello everyone, this is the last lecture for the Applied Portfolio Management class for the Spring 2020 class. Um, and in this lecture I'm going to go over comparative company analysis. At the beginning of the course I told you that we would go through uh, absolute valuation and relative valuation. This is a form of relative valuation. The idea here is that we're not looking at the cash flows of the firm in general with relative valuation. We're not looking at the cash flows of the firm and the discount rate and trying to find it an intrinsic value based on that, but rather we're comparing firms within an industry to determine which ones might or might not be a good buy based on their relative value to other firms, okay, to, to similar firms hopefully. And that's really one of the biggest problems with relative valuation is really finding those similar firms to uh, compare other firms with. We're going to go through some examples though and uh, you know talk a little bit about how we might adjust for that. So uh, the idea behind comparative company analysis is that investors compare like assets or firms in search of ones that are undervalued compared to other to similar firms. Now, one assumption is that the firms within the industry and industry are in general fairly valued. So if we've got an industry where all of the values are are off, then you know finding a comparative value that that looks good uh, still may not be a good value. And and really, you know, one thing to consider here is the dot com bubble burst in the late 1990s and in and 2000, uh, where you had all of the companies in the industry practically were way overvalued, were extremely overvalued. So using this approach in that case still probably wouldn't have resulted in a good uh, company, a good investment. Uh, one, way, one, one thing I want you to think about here is that when, we, uh, when you did your, your assignment where you analyzed the student investment fund as it is now with the holdings that it is now, one thing that I asked you to do and one thing that you certainly did do was find holes, uh, um, industries or sectors where we don't have investments in those areas. And one thing that you're doing, hopefully have, have done by now, um, as the assignments do here in a few hours, is that you, you've compared, some of you at least, have, have compared, um, it, for example, uh, banks. Um, you're, you're looking at different banks and we're going to compare those banks as a class. And, and so, um, because that was a, a whole, uh, an area, where uh, some of you felt we, we needed to add an investment in that area. So that's an example of what we would do in this case. We would take uh, different firms within that sector or within that industry that are comparable and we we try to figure out which one is the better buy between those different firms. And so uh, that that's kind of how comparative company analysis uh, works. It's how it fits into portfolio management. Uh, is, is we find a hole, we find a place where we need an investment in an industry or in our sector and we can use this to kind of uh, narrow down our, our different possibilities to look at. If we find you know one that looks relatively undervalued compared to the other firms within that er area, then that's certainly a good one to investigate some. So what I've got here is that an important part of relative valuation is to examine different facets of the firms being compared to determine if the differences in ratios are justified based on the differences in performance of the firms. So we don't want to just look at like a price to earnings ratio and compare it across firms. We want to see well why, what might be driving the difference there. An activist investor might look at those drivers of the difference and say okay the assets of the firm of, of this firm um, are undervalued because of management, because management's making poor decisions. So we're going to buy up a bunch of the, the stock of the firm. We're going to get rid of the existing management. We're going to put new people in um, and, and bring those values up uh, to where they should be comparable to other firms within that industry or within that sector. So what I've got here is um, an important part of relative valuation is to examine different facets of the firm being compared to determine if the differences in ratios are justified based on the differences in performance of the firms. If they are justified, could changes in the underperforming firm be made to increase value? So I've got an illustration here, and I like to use this illustration because housing, uh, real estate is, is very tangible. You know, you, you know what houses are like, you go into a house, you can, 
you can you know kind of touch and feel a house. Um, I, I also like to use commercial appraisals sometimes. Um, they, they can also be very useful for this, especially thinking about how we value stocks and other assets. We can look at a commercial real estate appraisal, which is an appraisal of a commercial building like a, an office building or a store and uh, get an idea you know from that we look at cash flows you know, how much can the space be rented for or is being rented for you know our cost approach and then we have the comparable approach with a residential real estate uh, but with just a house um, we, we get rid of that cash flow analysis because these are appraisals for probably an owner occupied house and so there's not a, a cash flow that's expected to be coming in from this house and so that makes it more comparable to this comparative company approach the cash flow analysis for a commercial building is very comparable to what you did for the absolute valuation approaches the free cash flow analysis kind of the dividend discount model or the free cash flow to the equity um, holders so uh, this is a, a a, a uniform residential appraisal report. I've bought three homes. I've sold two of them. Every time we do that transaction, there's an appraisal. Uh, it's required by the lenders to make sure that the value of the house is there to lend against. And so I'm going to take you through this. This is a sample appraisal, but it is very standard. Um, you'll, you'll notice it says uniform up here somewhere it says uniform uh, appraisal report and it really is uniform appraisers use a computer program to fill everything in to make sure that it is all consistent okay so this is a sample appraisal I'm just scrolling down and this is out on D2L for you too so they they go through and they describe this is what's being appraised this house on this many acres in this location so this is the it's referred to as improvements, but essentially what's on the land. In this case, you've got a, a house that is uh, 1,052 square feet. Um, it's got an average location. The house is 41 years old. Its condition is average. It is six rooms, three bedrooms, and one bath. The final estimate of value. So Leonard Wilson says this house is worth $185,000. And sorry, here's where it says uniform residential appraisal report talks about where it's at if it's been sold recently because that you know if it's been traded hands recently then we have a good idea of the value because that's a transaction that's taking place between two parties um, and they've decided on a value again here we just have a, a description of the area that it's in the neighborhood so you can kind of think of that neighborhood if you're thinking about uh, stocks uh, you can think of that as the industry or the sector that the stock is in so you know what are, what are the other stocks around it like what are the other firms in that sector like um, you know we certainly wouldn't take a house that's in a very rundown neighborhood and want to compare that to a house in a very upscale neighborhood because when you buy a house you're also buying that neighborhood and and this is just a little side note but a, a general a good rule is not to buy the most expensive house in a neighborhood um, because the the value of that house no matter what you do to it the value of that house is limited by the value of the other houses in the neighborhood okay? you're better off buying the least expensive house in a neighborhood uh, than buying the most expensive house because when you buy the least expensive house you have room for that value to go up as you make improvements to the house or you um, you know fix things at the house uh, you really don't have that much room if you're buying the most expensive house in a neighborhood and I've seen that a lot in fact one of my uh, the houses in my neighborhood probably run you know in, in value between 150 and 160 thousand there's a house for sale for 220 thousand like half a block from my house and um, there, recently about a block and a half away from my house there was a, a house that's been for sale they finally it looks like they're gonna finally sell it for about the same price 220,000 uh, but it's been on the market for a year and a half um, so they've had a difficult time selling it likewise with this new one that just went on the market it's really overpriced for the neighborhood and so they'll probably have a um, difficult time getting it sold at that price so probably probably have to come down in price if they want to get it sold anyway that's a little side note so what we're looking at here um, is 
very much akin to the approach that we're taking with the comparative company analysis and and what we've got on here is really the main part of the the, the appraisal where the appraiser goes out and finds comparable company uh, comparable um, houses um, and then makes adjustments based on the differences between the houses the comparable houses here and the house that's being appraised so we've got three different um, three different houses here for appraisal you can see here that they're fairly close to the the um, the house that's being appraised. One is 0.36 miles, a, a couple blocks away. One's one and a half miles, just a little further away, and then one's 1.06 um, miles away. So in between those two, we find the sales price. So that's the market value in a way of the firm. Uh, the sales price divided by gross living area. So it's 171 dollars a square foot here. $172 a square foot here and then $147 um, per square foot for the third uh, third option there. It's going to go through the different ways in which they were sold. Um, most of them are fee simple, which is a straightforward mortgage and, and purchase. The size of the um, land that it's on, the design of the house, so for example, the house that's being uh, looked at here has a brick vinyl on the outside while the other ones just have vinyl siding. And so the subject house, they, they're adding value to the subject house here when comparing them. You can see the same thing down here. Um, the, the subject house has a full basement, uh, a bedroom, a family room uh, in the basement while these other ones um, have just a slab so no no basement and you can see where well, these two here have a slab with no basement um, yeah no basement and so the value of the subject house is upgraded by twelve thousand five hundred dollars in those cases um, the the last one has a a full basement but it's uh, the difference being is that there's no bedroom in the in the basement and and this is actually an interesting thing when you go to look at houses and, and how they're appraised and how they're described, it's very important. Uh, if they say they have a bedroom in the basement, it becomes more valuable. If it's an actual bedroom, so for example, it has to have an, what's called an egress window, which is a window that in the case of an emergency, someone could get through that window and out of it. And there's you know very technical details on, on what that means. Um, but if they have an egress window, and if they have a closet, and those are the two things that we kind of look for in basements is an egress window and a closet to make it so that um, that you can say that's an actual, actual basement. Uh, functional utility, everything's the same there. Um, the subject house does not have a deck while these, um, or, or a front porch, it looks like, um, well, the first comparable has a deck, so they reduced the the subject value the the value of the subject house by three thousand six thousand compared to the second house because it has a porch and a deck, and then three thousand again compared to the third house because it has a deck. And really, the the purpose of all this is to show you that they um, they make an initial valuation and they make adjustments to that. We're not going to get that technical in our examples, but that's that's kind of how it's done. And so I wanted to show you that so you get an idea of you know what it looks like to compare different assets and to make adjustments to the value of those assets based on the characteristics of the assets and the different amounts. All right. Oh, and here's the second approach. It's called the cost approach. Not not relevant to what we're doing, but it's something interesting to look at. The appraiser is looking at how much it would cost to build the house. So what they did here is they have the opinion value of the site. Okay. So that's just the land itself would cost 60000 The cost of building the house that's on that site is new is 158124 It's depreciated by $23,719 because of the age of the house. So uh, depreciate cost of improvements. And so the improvements again are the house itself and everything that's been put on that land so the depreciated value is 134,405 the the value of the site improvements 
um, that the improvements that have been made, maybe like landscaping and things like that, is three thousand dollars. So you get one hundred and thirty-seven four hundred five, and you add that to the opinion of the site value of sixty thousand, and the cost approach would give us a value of one hundred ninety-seven thousand four hundred five dollars. Um, here are three more comparables um, that were included, and again, just going through the same thing. Different uh, adjustments were made. Uh, here they're doing a market analysis report. So you might hear it's a buyer's market, market, it's a seller's market, and some adjustments are made based on the current market for houses during that time period. All right, so let's go back to the notes now. That's just, again, just to give you an idea of how comparables work. And I really like looking at appraisals to get ideas on how we um, appraise other types of assets. So we're going to look at um, different examples of comparing companies. And here are the definitions that uh, we're going to look at. One ratio that is frequently used in comparing companies is the price to earnings per share ratio or the price to earnings ratio. You can have a leading uh, price to earnings ratio or sorry, a forward price to earnings ratio, which is using the price today uh, divided by the expected earnings uh, in the next year or over the next year. Um, in this case, we're, we're actually looking at a, um, a price to earnings ratio that's trailing, so it's called the trailing PE, and we're using the earnings per share for the last 12 months. The price to book ratio, there's no leading or um, there's no forward or trailing uh, price to book ratio would take the price today divided by the most recent book value of equity per share and that's it. Price to sales is the price per share divided by the sales or revenues per share for the firm and again we're using the trailing one here which is the last 12 months of sales. Um, so, so let me stop there and explain what this means. Uh, price to earnings means that this is the price, the dollar per dollar of earnings that someone is willing to pay for this firm right now. Uh, these ratios are somewhat indicative of the, the expectations of the investor of how this firm is going to perform in the future. So for example, if you've got one firm that has a very high price to earnings ratio and one that has a very low price to earnings ratio, you might interpret that as the one with the low price to earnings ratio is undervalued while other people would look at that and say well maybe maybe not it's it's actually the you know people believe that the one with a high price to earnings ratio is going to do better in the future than the one with a low price to earnings ratio we're going to kind of see that and that's why we do this is to look at different performance measures and different balance sheet measures uh, for the firm to get an idea if if that difference in comparable ratio there is justified based on the different aspects of the firm. Enterprise value is the market capitalization which is the value of all the firm's uh, stock multiplied by the price per share so this is really the market value of the firm's equity plus the firm's interest bearing debt minus its cash and short-term investments so we can think of the total capital of the firm being the market cap plus the interest-bearing debt and we subtract out cash and short-term investments because that's in a way cash and short-term investments are negative debt um, their liquidity if the firm knew they didn't need that money um, they could actually pay down the debt uh, by that amount the operating margin, um, in this case, we're going to define that as the earnings before interest and taxes divided by sales for the last 12 months. Return on equity is net income divided by the book value of equity. Return on assets is net income divided by the total assets. And those are those operating margin, ROE and ROA are all performance measures. Okay. Finally, the debt to equity ratio. Um, I, I just wanted to include a debt ratio in here because it, it does become important. We're going to see that some of our differences in the the ratios we want to use for comparison are due to the amount of debt that a firm has. All right. So um, I tried to find some comparable firms um, that we could look be between, and I'm, I'm going to give you three examples. The first one to me kind of just makes sense that these should be comparable firms. MasterCard. Uh, and Visa 
So what both of these uh, companies do is that they're processors. So whenever you use the MasterCard, um, this company, MasterCard Incorporated, gets a little tiny fee for processing your payment. Um, Visa does the same thing. I should tell you, they are not banks. Um, you will often have a, a credit card that is, um, or you may have a credit card that is part of a bank. So think of Capital One. You can get a Capital One card. Capital One is also a financial institution. And you're using Capital One's money when you use your credit card. But the person, you know, the the processing company is either Visa or MasterCard. Okay. When you use, you know, I have an Amazon, you know, credit card. I don't know. I don't have it down here with me. I'm down in my basement. But the, the funding for that, you know, whenever I buy things using my Amazon credit card, the funding comes from a financial institution. It happens to be a Visa card. And so Visa is the processor. Visa is processing the payment or processing the transaction. A bank is providing the funding for that transaction. And we throw Amazon's name on it because they, they, uh, they, they bought that and uh, it's used. I use it because I get points um, on that credit card. So that's kind of how MasterCard and, and Visa work is they're really processing companies. They're not banks um, and uh, they, they process transactions. So essentially they should be very comparable, especially in their operations. What they do is, is very, very close to each other. The price to earnings ratio, if we look at this and we compare the two. So right now, um, investors are willing to pay $45.24 per dollar of earnings from MasterCard. For Visa, it's $39.97. So it's a little higher for MasterCard. If you were saying these are perfectly comparable firms, then Visa might be the cheaper one, might be the one you want to look at. But then we get down to the next one, and it, and it, this is where we see some really big differences. The price to book ratio. So this is the price per share divided by the book value of equity per share. It's 49.26 for MasterCard. It's 12.36 for Visa. That's a huge difference. I'm going to show you where that difference comes from here in a minute. Okay, so that's one you might look at that and say, wow, Visa is really undervalued or MasterCard is really overvalued uh, compared to the book value of equity. And then finally, price to sales. Uh, they're very close. Uh, for every dollar of sales, an investor is worth willing to pay $15.74 for uh, MasterCard's uh, stock. And for every dollar sales for Visa, investors are willing to pay currently $15.83. So very, very close uh, on those. Uh, Visa is a larger company than MasterCard. The operating margin, Visa has a little bit better operating margin. So remember that's EBIT divided by sales. And here's where the big difference comes in. Okay, When we look at ROE, the return on equity for MasterCard is huge. Uh, 147.74% compared to that of Visa at 35.68, which is still a really good return on equity. So that's one big difference between the two. Okay. The other big difference and the, what, what drives that difference, we can see ROA here. MasterCard does have a higher ROA and, and fairly significantly higher, but not to the degree that we see up here with the ROE. If you think back to the um, modified DuPont analysis, how we get ROE. Um, the, the difference between ROE and ROA is that level of debt uh, in the capital structure versus equity in the capital structure. So here I've got the debt to equity of MasterCard. It's 2.27 versus Visa, which is 0.49. So a big difference here. So one of the drivers in this price to book ratio is the fact that MasterCard has very little book value of equity. I shouldn't say very little, much less book value of equity than it um, that compared to its debt than Visa. So there's where we get a big difference here. So taking that into account, we still do have a um, an improved performance on ROA. Okay. However, return on assets. However, the operating margin is better for Visa. So, you know, when I look at this, taking that all into account, it looks like 
If I look at price to earnings, if I look to price to sales, these are fa two fairly closely um, valued companies um, by the market, by, by investors. This price to book ratio is due to the large amount of, of debt that MasterCard has versus its equity. So I want to pull up um, MasterCard and look at their balance sheet and compare that to that of Visa. So I'm looking at here at the most recent press release balance sheet. Remember balance sheet is a point in time. So it's not looking at the performance over a year. It's just looking at what is, is out there right now. If I'm looking at the equity value, total common equity is 5.398 billion. The total liabilities is 25.15 billion. So that's where we get a um, very high debt to equity ratio. And the reason for that is this line right here, treasury stock. So what MasterCard has been doing is they've been repurchasing their, their stock and um, maybe using debt to do that. We can certainly see here their long-term debt has grown by in the last, well, I'm looking at just fiscal year ends. It grew a lot. Um, it grew a lot since between December 2019 and March, 20, uh, March 31st, 2020. And think of it this way, interest rates in that time period have dropped dramatically. They were low be before, they've dropped even more. And so what, they, what MasterCard did was they went out and took out a bunch of debt. Uh, they took an out uh, almost four billion dollars in debt. They repurchased some stock with that, and and they've been repurchasing a lot of stock. The act of doing that while taking on more debt um, has increased that debt to equity ratio and has increased, you know, barring any other changes, has dramatically increased their return on equity, and that's why their price to book value is probably so much different than than Visa. So let's just look up Visa real quick. So Visa um, has a, you know not much difference in terms of the amount of debt um, compared to MasterCard. However, they have you see this treasury stock. They don't repurchase their stock, or at least that's not showing up here. Uh, there's another way firms can repurchase their stock, but we usually see that as a drop in retained earnings. So they're not out repurchasing their stock. They're not decreasing their amount of equity, although they they are. Well, actually, they're reducing their debt by some too, and so that is really the big difference there between the market to book ratios between the two firms. So, if you looked at this comparison, let's ignore price to book ratio because the difference is explained here by the difference in the debt ratios and that ROE is as well. Um, I'd probably want to investigate a little bit more about this difference in return on assets relative to the operating margin. Again, Visa has a little bit better operating margin. Um, MasterCard has a better um, return on assets. But but taking that you know out of the picture for right now, the price to earnings ratio is a little bit higher for MasterCard. The price to sales ratio are almost identical between the two. And we can kind of take this price to book out of the analysis because it's explained by the large difference in return on equity. So um, in my, Kind of very quick appraisal of this they're they're both comparably valued by the marketplace um, i don't think that you're going to buy one and and see that it's a great value compared to the other in this case okay so let's move on to the next uh the next comparable i like to call this the cola wars um if you know much history back in the 80s the big cola wars between coca-cola and pepsi and in this case i included four firms I, I put in Coca-Cola and Pepsi because those are kind of the traditional comparables, although Pepsi isn't that comparable to Coca-Cola because a large part of Pepsi's business is Frito-Lay and in general snack foods. Coca-Cola doesn't do snack foods. Okay, so there is a difference there between the two. I included Monster Beverage because they only make beverages. Um, 
they, they're not in exactly the same space as Coca-Cola. Uh, they really uh, focus on energy drinks. Coca-Cola is trying to get into that area a little bit more. My wife brought home some actually, you know, Coca-Cola branded energy drinks uh, recently. She's not a Pepsi fan. And, and so, um, you know, they're trying to get into that market and, and compete against Monster. And then I included Fizz just because I like the ticker symbol. Uh, it's National Beverage Co Corporation. It makes um, LaCroix, if you're a fan of LaCroix, and good old fashioned Shasta. Um, and then one called Rock and Rye, and that just sounded weird to me. But I just included it for fun. Um, and because it is, it is a, it is a soda company, uh, certainly not nearly the size of Coca-Cola, but it does uh, engage in similar um, work. So uh, just to go through these, the price to earnings ratio, you know, it's, it's not a widespread between these. Um, so for Coca-Cola, it's 29.72. For Pepsi, it's 31.99. Not a big difference there. Monster has a little bit higher one. And again, they're in a more specialty area. Um, well-defined area 36.85 and then National Beverage Corporation LaCroix and Shasta 2488 so they have the lowest one um, and, and part of this is probably due to the rec the recognizability of the coca-cola Pepsi and monster brands relative to National Beverage Corporation um, it just, just doesn't come to mind when you think of soda the price to book ratio so again, this is, and, and it, you can also think that this is the same as the market to book ratio. Um, so it's 11.05 for Coca-Cola, it's 14.06 for Pepsi, and we get down here lower for Monster and for National Beverage Corp um, at 5.68. So there is some, some difference there um, between the, the two. Pepsi, the highest at 14.06, Fizz the lowest at 5.68. The price to sales, We have a wide variation here, uh, two, uh, 5.38 versus 2.79. And remember that the um, the price to sales, well, remember that Coca-Cola and Pepsi have different, they, they make different products. Pepsi and Coca-Cola both make drinks, waters, juices, sodas. They're known for that, but Pepsi also sells a lot in snack foods and snack foods are going to have a, a lower profit margin and so um, you know they, they have to generate more sales to get the same level of profits okay, so that's why Pepsi and Coca-Cola are, are comparable with each other in terms of uh, price to earnings but uh, not not terribly comparable in price to sales it's because of this operating margin down here Pepsi has a lower operating margin they're generating less income operating income off of a dollar of sales because a lot of those sales in the snack food areas um, they don't have as high profit margins soda is cheap to make um, soda is inexpensive to make and to, and, and to sell it's combining syrup they make the syrup and either they or bottling plants are, are combining that with carbonation, carbonated water, and putting it in a bottle or a can or a big sack that goes out to a, um, a restaurant or a convenience store. So soda is so cheap, has high margins. Um, not so much for, for snack foods, they're, they're more expensive to make. So this is not surprising and that explains the difference in the price to sales per share between Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Um, the margin for Monster is even better, uh, the operating margin than, than Coca-Cola. And again, uh, it's bef because if you think about that that can of Monster, um, you know, drink at Walmart or Dillon's or wherever you go to buy yours, um, it's it costs more. Okay, they're generating more profits off of their their sales. Looking at this profit margin, uh, excuse me, this operating margin between the two. And so it also makes sense that they have a higher price to sales ratio. Okay. It also makes sense uh, that they have a higher price to sales ratio because of this ch difference in, in operating margin. And that also explains the, uh, the value here. I am not a, um, I'm not a fan of LaCroix. I've tried it. It's not for me. Um, I like my, my sodas with a little more pop to them. But, but I remember Shasta when I was a kid.
we we drank the Shasta um, and they have lower profit margins they sell their sodas for less okay so they still have to produce it it still it probably has a similar cost to the larger ones but the, the the cost what they can sell them for is less and so that operating margin is less and we can also see again that ties back into this price to sales margin okay so the differences in the the, the kind of large differences here relatively in price to sales margins can be explained by these differences in operating margins the return on equity high for coca-cola high for pepsi i'll tell you both of them have gone through this uh, situation where they've taken out a lot of debt and they've used that to repurchase their stock just like what we saw with mastercard versus visa these two companies monster and fizz have very little debt compared to their equity okay. so you can see a big difference here versus here and that is why despite having lower ROAs return on assets for Coca-Cola and Pepsi compared to Monster and Fizz their return on equity is so much higher because of that use of debt so again when we look at these companies the differences in our different ratios up here comparable ratios can be explained by operating differences again Pepsi sells a lot of snack foods those snack foods are more expensive to make they have lower operating margins which results in lower price to sales ratios okay. and we see the same thing here with fizz and as i mentioned before they sell for less comparable compared to what it costs them for production and that's what's lowering their their operating margin so again if i'm looking at this i can't look at this and say this is this company is just a you know it, it's it's undervalued compared to these other ones because the differences in these ratios can largely be explained by the differences in operations and the differences in capital structure and if if we think that the market is efficient or generally efficient that's really what we should find is that the differences in the price to earnings ratios the price to book ratios the price to sales ratios can actually be explained uh, when we look at the fundamentals of the firm the last one I want to go through is Starbucks versus Dunkin Donuts I'm not a fan of uh, coffee I, I drank it a few times it's just not for me I'm a fan of Dunkin Donuts I like donuts um, I like donuts a little too much so when I'm going into this I'm going in biased I want Dunkin to be a better company so let's take a look the, the results here are really weird and I'm gonna pull up their financial statements and show you why but we look at Starbucks um, its price to earnings ratio is 41.13 the price to earnings ratios for Duncan is 25.05 the price to book ratio is NM um, I don't know if that means not mentioned or not measurable I think it's probably not measurable I'm going to show you why that is the price to sales is very close between the two 3.51 uh, the price of $3.51 per dollar of sales for Starbucks $3.76 for Duncan the enterprise value for Starbucks is 112 billion about 113 billion dollars for Duncan it's only 8 billion the operating margin for Starbucks is 13.72 percent the operating margin for for um, Duncan is 31.68 so we see a big difference here Okay, we see a big difference between Duncan and and Starbucks and their operating margin and remember a little bit that uh, Dunkin Donuts is is a different company I mean they both make coffee um, you know Starbucks really relies on those coffee sales that's why you know that that operating margin seems a little strange to me but I guess donuts aren't that expensive to make um, and so uh, Duncan gets a higher um, operating profit off of their or, or margin off of their sales because they're selling donuts and I again not a coffee fan but I, I, I could probably feel like their their coffee isn't as fancy you can't do as much you know can't get the I think my wife's favorite is the vanilla soy latte um, there at Starbucks I don't understand it um, so you know their operating margin is less here at Starbucks and if you remember back 
you know, we, we saw a difference in operating margins. Okay, explained the differences in price to sales. We should expect to see the same thing here. And the price to sales margin for uh, ratio, sorry, for Duncan is a little bit higher, but not where we, or at least where I would expect it to be based on this operating margin. Okay, I would expect it to be a lot higher. Um, the return on assets is 10.13 versus 7.36 for Duncan. So Starbucks has a better return on assets. And then the debt to equity, I'm going to show you why these just have uh, uh, error terms because I'm going to pull them up. Um, so let's go out here. We'll take a look at Starbucks. Okay, and I'm, I, I'm out here on the balance sheet for Starbucks. And I'm going to go here to their equity. So what's happened over time here, so this is in 2015, and this is the most recent. Uh, this is, you know, an interim report of a six month report for the year but that doesn't really matter when we look at the balance sheet because we're looking at a point in time so the, the total common equity went from 5.8 billion in 2015 went up went down went way down went way way down keeps continuing going down and it doesn't show up here as treasury stock because of how starbucks is repurchasing their stock. So there's two approaches uh, to recording a stock repurchase on the balance sheet of a firm. One is the way that we usually see where it's the the uh, the, the amount that they repurchased in dollars. So let's say that Starbucks repurchases five billion dollars worth of stock. We would see a negative value here of five billion dollars for the treasury stock. Okay, that would go into treasury stock. However, and, and that's if they if they don't retire the stock. Okay. If they repurchase the stock though and retire the stock, it's not going to show up in treasury stock because it no longer exists. They eliminated that stock. Okay. And so that's why that's what's happening here with retained earnings. Because, you know, what we would usually see if, if retained earnings are becoming negative is that the firm is actually losing money. But in the case of Starbucks, they're very profitable. And so what's happening here is they're actually buying up stock. And it doesn't give you that much detail here on Snap Capital IQ, but what's happening is when they repurchase that stock, they retire the stock. So they, they make it disappear. And so it shows up as decreasing retained earnings. All right, so that's what's happening here. Starbucks has negative equity. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the result of them repurchasing their stock. Um, and then now the, the value of the repurchased stock is more than the value of the assets for the firm. And that's why we see that the total assets of the firm are 27.5 billion. The total liabilities of the firm are 35 billion because they've been taking out debt. See that here? And they've been using that to repurchase the stock of the firm. And here's where we get book values mixed in with market values. And that's why that happens. If we take a look here at Duncan. Oops, sorry. Looking at Dunkin' Donuts, and we see a similar situation where they have a little bit of treasury stock, and what's happening there is they're probably repurchasing shares to be used to um, in executive compensation, because you can see it's it's very little that's going on there. Primarily, they are they are taking money and they're using it to repurchase shares of stock, and that also results in us having a negative equity, because they've repurchased so much of their stock that now the again the value of that repurchased stock is more than the value of the assets of the firm on the the book I should say the book value of assets on the firm. Right, so um, that's an explanation of that. It's hard to get a good read on, at least for me, it's hard to get a good read on this because of those those differences there that we really can't see in this chart. Um, I Or sorry, this table. You know, it looks, you know, if we're looking at price to sales, it does kind of look like that Duncan may be undervalued compared to Starbucks because Duncan has a much better operating margin, but the price to sales ratio just really isn't showing that. Um, again, not terribly comparable companies here. 
Duncan is trying to move into the uh, the coffee area, um, but, um, but still they rely heavily on sales of donuts and things like donuts uh, for their value. So that's all I have for comparative company analysis. The main takeaways from this is that we can use this approach to identify firms that might be under or overvalued compared to their um, firms in their industry or in their sector. Again, we're going for com fairly comparable firms. Differences in those price to earnings, price to sales, and price to book ratios can often be explained by looking at the profitability of the firm and the capital structure of the firm and the differences of those. And when we have a situation where that isn't explainable, that, that those don't explain it and other things don't explain it, um, then that's where we want to start looking at whether one firm is actually undervalued and maybe that's a good buy uh, compared, you know, if, if we want to get into an industry or a sector. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I'll give you some questions about this on your, your final exam. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about it or anything about this was confusing. I'm happy to go over it uh, with you in more detail. I hope you have a great week.